All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Knowledge and Mileage podcast. The person on the other line here that is speaking to me, and if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see him over there wearing a Tri Club hat, is Pritchard in Wales. Now, this has been a long time coming. This has been, uh, I don't know, I've been asking him to get on this uh, show for about a year, and he's just been avoiding it, but now finally pinned him <laughs> down. <laughs> and he's, yeah, he's on the show. <laughs> So Pritchard, uh, if you may know Pritchard from that crazy TV show and the movie Dirty Sanchez, and uh, it, it's funny now because it's, it's, there's quite the antagonistic combination because it's like this guy just wants to die early, but now looking at the way that he eats and the way that he has all these crazy uh, endurance adventures, he wants to combine the longevity sector with you know, living, well, sleep when you're dead and living uh, until you get into a very early grave. So uh, Pritchard, man, I tell you what, this introduction is going to be very difficult. Like you are a pro, pro skateboarder, you, you, you turn pro at what age? 21. 21, and you will hold several world records, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. Uh, and you have a TV show, you've just come out with your second book, you've got yourself a tattoo parlor, you've got yourself a barbershop, things are going pretty good, huh? Yeah, I've got this, I, like yourself, I like to keep myself busy, because if I don't keep myself busy, I go do that, fucking tap. So, uh, yeah, the more, but at the same time, the more things I find to do, the more stuff that starts stressing my head out. So there's quite, a, there's a bit of a fine balance going on there, because too much, I can't handle it, but too little, I can't handle that either. So there has to be like this, um, yeah, like I say, fine balance, but. I yeah, think... I mean, we've just opened it. We've just opened Lemmy's Chop Shop as well, so we've got a dog groomer's uh, place as well now. That's so right. There's, so... there's two. There's, there's one tattoo and barb shop in Cardiff who's been going for six years. We have got a tattoo shop in Bargoy. We have got Lemmy's Chop Shop, and um, we've got the the Sleeping the Dead Triathlon. Uh, I've just started my own production company as well. So yeah, there's there's a lot going on at the moment. And of course, I've got the dirty vegan stuff and the books and this and the, yeah. So it's it's, it's it's fucking yeah, bonkers. It's a lot of delegation to do. So where do you go and have your hair cut? Is it at the barbers or is it at Lemmy's Chop Shop? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering why you got the hat on, I man. Go, you know. I go to the. I literally I just went yesterday. Like, oh, there you oh, go. Man, it's all shaved off. Lemmy's Chop oh, Shop there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm getting that age now, Chris. When I'm getting the bald patch is showing, so it's, and I always said, if I got bald, I ain't gonna hide that, I'm just gonna shave it all off, do you know what I mean, it doesn't bother me. Shave it off, then hide it with a hat. Yeah, this all gets cold in my house, so I don't pay the electricity. <laughs> right, so, uh, well, we'll we'll get onto the, the TV show and the book a little bit later, but obviously, uh, you know, you, you, you become, you pro, you turn pro as a uh, pro skateboarder at uh, 21 years old, and before <laughs> that, you actually went to college to be qualified as a chef, correct me if I'm wrong, before that. Yeah, I did, yeah. There was, um, when I was in school, that you know, you see the careers teacher and they would say, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a stuntman. And they were like, you what? I said, so I want to be a Hollywood stuntman. Ah, nah, you can't do that. And I was just like, what? And my next best thing was cooking. I really enjoyed cooking. Uh, she said, well, that, well, that's a better career's choice you know what it would have been like back in the old days like you needed a doctor or a nurse or this whatever a uh, chef oh yeah that's a decent job so i sort of got work experience and then i rolled up for a college uh, course uh, in college avenue in cardiff which is not there anymore it's all in cardiff met now but i did a two-year course uh catering uh, and, uh, and and the hospitality industry really enjoyed it had fun Spent most my, spent my, my, most of my lunch but skateboarding whilst everyone else was going to the pub, so I wasn't a typical student. Um, and finished, got a job in a Persian restaurant in Cardiff, uh, cooking in there whilst looking after the takeaway as well. Not really going to get into it. I had a really, really bad experience um, with the owner. Uh, he's, he's an horrible bastard. And if I ever saw him today, most probably put my fist through his face but anyway it is what it is you live and you learn and I left well I didn't leave he sat me and I started cleaning windows uh, with my friend and skateboarding so 
yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was good. <laughs> So when you were skateboarding, what it, you know, this is going back a few years. Was it, uh, you know, was it? Could it subsidize your wage? Were you getting paid well to do this? Because I know that you were traveling around Europe and around uh, UK. You know, what was what was the climate then for pro skateboarders? I mean, I, I was going to like skate comps and skate demos and all that kind of stuff. And, and back then, you know, this is before social media. Nobody, whatever, used to communicate via the landline and stuff and magazines and. You know, there was a good skate scene back then in Cardiff, and and you know we'd skate every Saturdays and Sundays outside the Cardiff Banks Central Station, uh, which is all gone now, obviously. Um, and I wasn't earning money off of skateboarding then. I was just, I just loved it. I absolutely loved it, like yourself with weight training and stuff. I did it twenty four seven, and. Then you know we started entering a few comps and stuff, and, and the only thing that paid for my life was my cleaning the windows. So I cleaned the windows and that paid for me to go and pay for my skateboards, pay for my travel. And then I went to a place called Radlands, which is a really famous skateboard um, uh, skateboard park. And I, I entered the competition and I came, I still still know in my head to remember it. I, I did my competition line, so I used to get really nervous at skate comps. And I, I thought, fuck, I'm not, I'm not falling off anything, yeah? I'm having the time of my life and I was just like shit I just landed everything and then I won that competition and then that's when uh, Alvin from Phase 7 sent one of his riders down to, to speak to me and say oh you know um, that guy up there Alvin he runs a distribution company he'd like to sponsor you and I was like fuck no way man that's that's sick yeah he said we had to use his number give him a ring but at the same time Carl Shipman, who was a very good skateboarder at the time, he was skateboarding for a company called Deathbox, which is now called Flip Skateboards, which is out in America, and it's like one of the biggest companies in America. And he said, well, that guy there, Jeremy Fox, he wants to sponsor you as well. So I was, I was like this young guy with like these offers, and I just didn't know who to go with. And in the end, I went with, went with Alvin. And that's where, where my um, sort of skateboarding career started really and you had several sponsors backing you then didn't you didn't you have like was it uh a shoe company uh, uh city sir um cardiff uh was it city surf what's it what's the place called in cardiff city surf yeah city surf yeah you had a few sponsors then so was that able then to allow you to go to a lot of these competitions without doing the window cleaning job or you still had to continue that i still clean i still i still clean windows but every month I got this package and it just felt like Christmas Day every month. I was just like all these boards, all these shoes, clothing, wheels, you name it. I was just like, wow, wow. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You know, you're a kid and you're like, oh, I never expected any of this. So, you know, you didn't need it all. Uh, so, you, you know, you'd sell some to friends and make some money. And, and at the same time, if they wanted me to go to a competition or a demo and stuff, it was all paid for and travel was paid for. But that, it wasn't until later on then, which Alvin said, um, we're going to start a British skateboard company called Panic. And we want you to be the first professional skateboarder. And I was like, what? You know, I never in my life did I thought I'd be a professional skateboarder at all. I mean, that was never the aim. I just enjoyed the sport. And I think off the back of doing what I did and stuff, and, I, I got up my first pro board. It went down really well. And at the time, I was working in a factory as well. I was working. I stopped window cleaning, and I was working in a factory making heating elements for industry. And I'd start work at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'd sit at this machine and just go, ehm, 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 all day long till 5 o'clock. <laughs> the, the, the happiest time of the day was when the blade smashed. smashed. Everyone went, hooray! It was like, whoa, happy day, the blade smashed. Brilliant. Fuck, you know, the monotonous stuff is just gone. So I was there for three years, and it was just fucking mind-numbing. But you've got to do what you've got to do to pay the bills. And, you know, when I was cleaning windows, my parents were like, you need to get a proper job, blah, 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 blah. And, but then this pro deal come along, and then I realised, right, I'm getting a check now. And I'm getting royalties for board sales. I don't need to work here anymore. I can just do what my, you know, what I've loved doing all my life, skateboarding all day, and travelling. Uh, so that's what I did. 
Right. Awesome. Yeah, it's funny. I t when you said that, is the same sort of thing happened to me when I was working at this place called BSW and it was a sawmill. When the ba and I was working there as an engineer, maintenance engineer. So when the bandsaw would break, the same thing. Everyone's like, yeah, great. You know, the production line then relied upon us to go uh, replace the bandsaw, you know? Yeah. And I, I, I sort of woke everyone up from their monotonous fucking behavior in the, in the factory as well, which is, uh, which is good, yeah. Yeah. I got fired from that place. They replaced me with a trolley, apparently. So uh, I obviously wasn't needed much. <laughs> <laughs> but they used to take the piss out of me. But it was always good. I really enjoyed the people that I worked with because they were just like, they were not me at all. Like, I was this guy who walked in with jeans hanging down his ass. Fucking big blood blonde, dyed blonde hair, black hair, fucking just like like the the factory weirdo clown or whatever. I walk in and everyone's like, what the fuck are you wearing today? And they used to call me Thrasher. I used to wear a Thrasher. Well, I did top back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. It's quite popular now, but back then, yes, yeah, so my nickname was Thrasher and they just always used to wind me up and play with me. But hey, the they were a good laugh. Yeah, happy days. So then we had this crazy transition happening from the time that you're pro skateboarding between you and Dayton. Dayton is another guy that was skateboarding there. Uh, I think he was Swansea. Was he Swansea? You were Cardiff? No, he, he's Cumbran. Oh, Cumbran, Cumbran. Yeah. And you guys are skating together. And then uh, a, a videographer decided to film you and Dayton. I think it was uh, Pritchard versus Dayton. Uh, you know, skating against each other, hitting each other, you know, just joking around, pranks, or whatever. And that got a lot of notoriety. You know, a lot of people saw that. And then that kind of transitioned into what became Dirty Sanchez, correct? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, well, Dave was the one who had Dave had a camera. A guy called Matthew Ryan had a camera. And, you know, we were just, we didn't have any, we were just filming what we were doing for a laugh. And, it was me versus Dane, so me and Dane always had this this friendly competition thing. If I did something, he'd have to do it. Blah blah blah, and it, and it sort of created this versus kind of thing. Uh, and we sort of played on that. And you know, Hancho was always involved because he would be always kipping, and we'd be messing around with him and doing what he doing, doing what we did in his sleep. And then we just came up with this idea because we had so much good footage. Um, we just came up with this idea: of, let's make a video. Uh, let's call it Pritchard versus Dayton. We'll we'll have Pancho in there. We need somebody else. We thought Joycey, he was known in the skate industry as being like this fucking weirdo. Always went to like events, getting naked, skate comps and stuff. So we thought, perfect. So we got Joycey involved. He said, yeah, cool. Um, let's call it Pritchard versus Dayton. We'll have a fight at the end, a boxing match to settle our scores at Lennox Lewis's gym that we managed to get in London. And um, we just started building footage and at the time, it was all VHS then and magazines. So it was word of mouth, like, fuck, I'm pushing Dayton, they're doing this video. It's, just, it's got some sick stuff in it. And that's when Joycey went to Rose Park Lake in Cardiff. And on a Sunday afternoon, he said, what are you going to do, Dan? Well, you're going to shit in my face. I'm going to shit in my hands and smash it in my face. We're like, what? It's a fucking Sunday afternoon down Rose Park Lake. There's people walking their dogs. There's all fucking people homes and stuff. He went, oh, I'll be all right. I'm like, <laughs> I was with our mates at the time, and they were just like, oh, I, yeah, I've got to get away from this shit, man. And he just fucking literally, I know, can picture the spot. Now, every time I walk past it, it just comes into my mind. He tutted down, he shat in his hand, and he's just laughing at it, going, <laughs> and, and before he did that, actually, an old guy came past, and he said, because he thought he was going to go swimming in the lake, and the old guy said, I wouldn't go swimming in there. It's full of chemicals. And Joycey said, oh, it's all right. I'm about to shit in my hand and smash it in my face. And the guy went, <laughs> just carried on walking. But then Joycey smashed it in his face. It was fucking disgusting. But of course, that was the talked about thing in the video when everyone wanted to watch it. We, we took it to trade shows with a trailer. We built the hype. It came out. Uh, we sold God knows how many copies of it. And then a talent, because I was working for Globe Skate Shoes at the time. I was a team manager for um, the skate team in the country. And Dane was the shoe rep, Globe Shoe Rep. I was his boss. <laughs> He'd love to hear that. <laughs> he doesn't like it when I say that. But uh, I, yeah, I was his boss. And uh, he, I, so 
I had a phone call. And there was this woman called Martha Delap, and she said, Hi, I'm Martha Delap from MTV. I've just seen your Pritchard Mrs. Dayton video. I'm, I'm a talent scout. We'd like you to come into MTV. And I'm just like, Fuck, Dayton's winding me up, yeah. And I honestly thought Dayton was winding me up. Cut a long story short, he didn't. They did want us to go into MTV. It's all Dayton. So me and Dayton went down to MTV, had the meeting. Uh, and then they said, and we give them the Pritchard for Sting video. Literally, two days later, the phone come again. Look, we are you guys. Come back in again. Could you bring Pantry and Ghosty this time? And we walked back into MDV, and, and that was it. Sanchez was born. That was it. Dirty Sanchez was born. And that was a TV yeah. series on NTV, which blew up. It was absolutely huge there. And what, what years was that? 2000 and... 2001. 2001, yeah, I remember it was massive all over Europe and obviously it made its way over here in the US. You did uh, the movie as well. It just blew up. Like, what was that? It went, it went, it went to 64 countries and to over 400 million people. Unreal. Mental. So, so I can only assume that put an end to your skateboarding career knowing that you were just doing that full time. Dude, skateboarding went right out the window. <laughs> I, I was just stuck in... I, my head was just stuck in that. Just it was just in this bubble of yeah, of, let's go fucking gnarly, and that's exactly what what we all did really. We just we just got stuck in. Yeah, I mean they where they filled that bank full of money. Never seen that much money before, and I was just like, I'm, I'm going for it, man. And it was just like we lived in a house in Cardiff. Uh, 22 out of Bella Street, and it was 122 out of Bella Street. I had to go and look for the house for them, and that was our base. And some of the stuff that went down there like, is not for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was fucked, but it was fun and it was brilliant. It was such a good time. It took 10 months to film that, and then it came out, and yeah, it took off. Yeah, it was crazy. Like, did you, like, have any of you guys, including yourself, like, suffered any permanent injuries from that that time? Yeah, my my mental health. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah, uh, and not 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 like physical injuries. I have got a few bumps and bruises and stuff, but nah. Apart from that, it's just. I mean, went to the doctor, went to the hospital quite a few times, um, but. Yeah, I yeah, had seven days in hospital for septicemia ones because I had a drill. They, they drilled through my hand because I lost the trip of pursuit. And then I woke up the next morning and my hand was like a bum. Went and told the doctor, and the doctor said, How'd oh, do you do it? And I said, oh, I lost the, tri- lost the trip of pursuit. So I had to have a drill through my hand. He went, <laughs> he, said, he said, Tell me the truth. I said, That is the truth. He went right straight into hospital bed. I went, It was there for seven days on a fucking drip and everything. Jeez. Yeah, fun guy. But they, but they couldn't put it on MTV. It was an MTV special, but they couldn't put it on there because it was so graphic. Yeah, I bet. That much, yeah, yeah. A drill through the hand. Yeah, yeah. interesting. So then, where did, like, going from Dirty Sanchez, and obviously that was a time where, you know, there was a lot of just craziness involved. How on earth did you actually transition from there into get into endurance sports like where's the tipping point that seems so far between that you know it, i can't see how that transition together i love the love the cup by the way <laughs> it's probably true <laughs> uh where did the transition it was i mean we did sanchez for years we did uh, three episodes of film me and date did another uh, ep- show called wrecked and then we did another show called Sanchez Get High, where we got paid to travel around the world, taking various um, illegal highs and stuff, which was which was most probably my my favorite TV show I've ever filmed. Um, so we did a, new, a load of things, and and you know with that lifestyle, it's just fucking booze, drugs, cigarettes, just fucking constantly, and you know you just don't, you just don't see it coming, and and what an analogy I just saw a footage of myself and I just thought Christ what's happened to me I was never like that and it was just it, it hit home a bit I thought Christ I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fucked and I decided to do something about it so I started taking up um, running and I wanted to do I did the Cardiff half when I was 15 
and I wanted to just see if I could do the Cardiff Ave again after years of bollocking myself. So I started training for that, did it, really enjoyed it, got a really good buzz off it, and started just started running. So I did a few Cardiff Aves. Some of them, may I add, were, you know, I was still partying, but it was almost like I, I had this, I was still partying, but I could, because I was training, it almost gave me that permission to go party in because I did like the yin and yang. Right? I'd done the good, so the bad. Uh, so I did a few Cardiff halves. I did them straight from gigs, Pistons fast. I did one Cardiff half off my head on crack once, uh, straight from a crack house. Uh, I, I did, yeah, did fucking loads of that kind of stuff. And then did the London Marathon twice. And then, of course, the ultimate was the Ironman. And... That was 2011, Ironman Bolton. And I got a, a gang of us together, me and my brother Alex Simmons and uh, Nathan. We started training for that. And I just thought, oh, there's no better training than let's cycle. I said to Alex Simmons, I said, let's cycle from John and go to the Land's End. I said, that's perfect fucking training, getting your legs on a bike, innit? So we thought, yeah, fuck it, let's do it. So we got our bikes and we cycled from John and go to the Land's End in seven days, I think it was. So we did the, the bike training. And then we did the running, and we did it, and that was it. I mean, I'll never forget, it was one of the hardest things at the time that I'd ever done. But I really enjoyed that that buzz and the mental torture that, you know, you, could, you, you I mean, you know yourself, you could, do I chuck the towel in? No, you don't, you pussy. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And, and it was that fight with my body and my mind that I really enjoyed especially when you cross the line and knowing you've accomplished something which you never ever, ever, ever thought in life that you'd ever do. So it was, yeah. But Bolton Ironman 2011, which which really did kickstart my uh, fitness journey. Yeah, it, it's funny, isn't it? Like, I think because you'd gone from just having this fixation of adrenaline when you're skateboarding and then obviously that adrenaline has just gone to another level when you're doing Dirty Sanchez, that's when you, you know, go down the road of alcohol and drugs all the time because you need those feel-good uh, hormones coming from something. And un unfortunately, it's exogenous, which isn't good for you. So now you're getting that endorphin rush from something else that has, is actually, in fact, good for you. So that's where that transition has come. And you, you probably got much more longevity coming out of that than what you did prior. So when you actually went into that transition, because like, I should imagine it was very difficult for you to say, okay, I'm gonna pack this up or I'm gonna start down this road. Did you have other people around you, like family members that were really concerned, that really helped you go down this path? Or was this pretty much a solo journey? It was just a solo journey, really. I no, I know what I, I know what I want, and when I know what I want, something I go and get it. Uh, I didn't really tell my mother about what I did, drugs wise and stuff. She I, she happened to find out because Stuart Cable, his book came out, his dog his autobiography, and there was a big thing in there about me and him doing drugs, and she that was in the newspaper, and she read about it. She's quite upset, which was which upset me away in a way as well, but. Um, you know, now she knows everything about it and it's all cool. But, um, uh, yeah, what was the question again, sorry? The question was, you know, when you transitioned from, you know, the Dirty Sanchez and, uh, yeah. you know, all the partying to going into this endurance world, you know, was it because you had support network or was it because you just, you know, you knew you had to make this change or you probably wouldn't live much longer? Yeah, that, that was it. I had to make that change. And, you know, like I said, mother didn't know anything. So I, did, I didn't really want, I, just, I yeah, I just wanted to, I was either, it was either make the change or really go down the wrong path. Yeah. You know, I would most probably wouldn't be here speaking to you now if I, if I carried on. I mean, everything was coming to an end, all the Sanchez stuff and everything. And you just know in your head that that kind of, that kind of lifestyle is coming to an end. And that's quite a, that's quite a hard, pill to swallow that is you know it was you know he was on the road for 10 15 years having the best best of the times and you know with my mates uh and just doing what we wanted and then that realization that whew, the the normal lifestyle is about to come back again after all that fun but you saw i didn't so with that like i said in my head i had to do something about it i, I 
I had some savings, um, and that that was the choice. That was the choice then. I was either put my savings into a business uh, and look after myself, or do all the spit, or do all my savings on drugs, booze, alcohol, raving, and then I fuck all, and then end up. Uh, working a job that I didn't want to be in and being happy for the rest of my life. So I remember I invested my money in the, my first tattoo barbershop, which was completely, you know, I've never been a businessman. I didn't know what to do. Luckily for friends and stuff, they were sort of helping me. And I did a few mistakes, but what you would do, when you, you, know, you live and learn. Uh, and luckily, so I six years today, the shop's still going. I think it's the best thing I ever did because, um, you know, the, sh- the shop's great. The team's great. Uh, you know, and 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 I, I managed to choose a, a life path which was which is better for me. Yeah, it's a, and it's a, it's a great it's a great at- atmosphere in there. Obviously, I, when I was living in Cardiff, I'd go in there all the time, and it's like a good atmosphere. It's a place where people just want to hang out. You know, and and I think that's that's where businesses make or break. You know, you can provide a good service, but unless you've got that good infrastructure where people just feel welcomed. You know, I, th- I think that's where you're going to make a break. So that now you've you've done your first Iron Man. Now that isn't enough for you. You've had to take it to another extreme. Like, why was that, and what were the extremes that you went to after doing that first Iron Man? Because you obviously have broken a couple of world records since then, and you've just taken that to another extreme. And I know charities have been a big part of that. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, I'm. As you, can, as you know, I'm a quite an addictive person. Uh, and when I'm at, I wasn't happy with just one Iron Man. I was looking for the next big, next big thing. And then you sort of find out about um, double Iron Man. It's just like, what, oh, double Iron Man? What, oh, bloody hell, you can't do that, can you? Because I can remember the agony I was in him in the first one. Continuous double Iron Man. All the swimming went, all the biking went, all the running went. So there was one uh, ultra, ultra man it was. Enduro man. So you know, me and my brother signed up for it and just just give this a go. <laughs> it was poor. It is what it was and it did everything it said on the turn. It was fucking tough. I had some really Yeah, I'm just tripping my face off. Because we I managed to manage to do it. It was just so hard. And then the following year then I thought after doing that, after finished the second one, I thought we've got to do the triple. And the triple was obviously seven seven point five mile swim, three hundred and thirty four mile bike and an eighty two mile run. And this was in and the the bike the swim loop was like one mile loops in this lake. Uh, just going round in circles like that. And then the bike was an eleven eleven mile loop. So you do eleven miles, come in take a bit of food, fuel, out again, out again, that, and just, I remember falling asleep on my bike, like in the, in the TT position, my head was going spinning, I was seeing it, seeing things, faces, skulls on the road, it was like free drugs, but I'm on a bike, and doors, the, 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 the roads were open, <laughs> the fucking open roads, I could have been under a van or whatever, and then I just started falling asleep, and I woke up, and I was like, whoa, fuck, I'm going towards a bush, but we got it done, and then the, the the run was like a, a one mile run as well. So you run just running around in one mile circles for like eighty two times. My fucking hand was going mental. But we but we got it done. So that was the, the double the one, the double and the triple ticked off. And then I just um I went for a run. I love running and that's where I get my best ideas when I'm running. Uh, I just came into my head, I thought, you know, I'd met see what the iron cowboy it did he did 50 50 full irons in 50 different states and stuff and i was just like Phew. i was thinking about that i thought fuck man, i'm on a lunatic God, i wonder if i can do something something like that but i do have i thought yeah well, I'll, well, no, in march 2016 i'll do 30 half iron men in 30 days at the time it was, a, it was a world record so iron cowboy held it there was 21 so i said i'll do it in cardiff Peter Allen sponsored it, and uh, yeah, so we did that and completed it. And it was just the good, the good thing I liked about it was the um, what's, what's the word the the reputation. Uh, you know, every day I had to wake up at four. Well, the discipline, the scheduling, 
the discipline, the schedule. I loved, I loved it. I had to, this was that done at that time. That was that time. That was that time. Again, start again. And that's what I liked about it. And I was in my mind. And I was in my own mind. I liked being in my own mind for a long time. Yeah. It's just... I can't find. I can't think of anything better. Than because I, I, re, I, rem, I remember when you did that, and you and I, I, I found out that you were doing a swim in the pool there at Cardiff. So you were yeah. doing a thirty half Ironman swims every day in a pool, going back and forth. And I was thinking, how on earth can you do that? I remember speaking to you and you saying that you know in school you was always daydreaming. And, you know, and now you use that daydreaming to your advantage because you can just switch off and daydream in the water. And it doesn't matter if you're going back and forth. You can actually lose yourself and enjoy it. Yeah, and th that is a massive part of endurance. Massive. Because if you can't switch off and you focus on that pain, if you, if, I mean, that's, I think that's how a lot of people fold. If you can, if, when I switch off and go in the zone, I can't even feel, I can't feel anything. I'm just... I'm, I'm I'm a wave of the fairies. I'm gone. So especially when I'm in water, I can't speak to anyone. I can't hear anything apart from the rush of the water, which is quite therapeutic and meditative at the same time. And I'm just sometimes I'll stop and I'll say somebody, "How far have we gone?" And they'll say, "We've done this." What have I? Christ! You just because you just you're not thinking. That's the, this is the best way to do it, I think. And. uh and yeah, you, that's the best way to be. And do you think, you know, from what you gained from Dirty Sanchez, obviously dealing with a lot of pain that you had to, had to, and you was able to shut that out, do you reckon that was transcendence to what you do now in endurance? Yeah, I think I think it all plays a, a big part. I mean, in school, I wasn't the brightest person. Like you said, I was a daydreamer. I had other, I had other things in my mind. Just writing maths and English and this, all that it was just bullshit to me. It was just over my head. I, there were other things that I wanted to do, and you know, just because I couldn't do that, I knew I could do this, and that's what I wanted to do. And yeah, this, and and, and being in Sanchez and feeling the pain and dealing with pain and learning how to deal with pain was a was a big part of it. Because I mean. You know, that, when I just done the Decker now, and that that was a fucking agony. Like literally, uh, one and, of the hard. What is the hardest thing you ever done? Do you want to explain what a Decker is? Yeah, I mean, there's two types of Decker. There's a, it's a full Ironman every day for ten days. That's that one. Or there's the this this the same the this the, an Ironman every day for. for, for and I, when I am on a day every day for 10 days, or there's the continuous, which is all the Ironman swims in one, which is 24 miles in a pool, 25 meter pool. And then there's 1,120 mile bike ride. And then there's a 262 mile run. So we decided to do the, the continuous. Uh, <laughs> and how much time was that on each one of those disciplines? I can't remember what the times were, but what I can tell you is I was in a fucking hot pool. I had a wetsuit on because obviously you sweat into the pool, you boy, and just slipping across bare. Uh, halfway through that 24 mile swim, I fucking started feeling the pain. And literally, from as soon as I felt that pain, I had constant pain until I finished 10 days later. And it was just non. It was non-stop. Sometimes it got so bad, I was in fucking tears. And, uh, oh, and what was that pain? I, I got, that... I got, chlor I got chlorine burn and everything all over my face, and it was just fucking just. My ass, like I did the bike. Looking at, at the time, the weather was pretty good, a little bit too good because it was the hottest day Britain's ever seen. So, but I was on my bike then, and there were people dropping like flies, and. Um, so you just had to take it easy, and my my ass, my underneath, my my fucking twant on my gooch, there was no skin on it. It all been taken off. So you just sort of sit in the corner, and it, it had all gone, and it was roaring. I had these huge big white heads on there. So every day I had to make sure I wouldn't get infection down there. So I had to keep cleaning underneath, and um, every pedal. 
heard. You know, again, you were just trying to switch off, but in the night time when the sun was coming down, you, you could just, it was in such a quiet place, like farmland. You know, you just have like tears of happiness and just like, I'm on my own, in silence. And it's just like, you know, I've been on my bike for what seemed like forever. And it was just, just tears of happiness. And it was just like, oh man, if I'm fucking doing this. And then next thing you know, it was just tears of pain. And it was just, it was just, it was a mental, mental roller coaster of just up and downs and stuff. And uh, I remember getting off the bike and the, the, me, the medic said, do you need to come and see me? I'd sort of gone, because I had all my glasses on my bike. So I had the wind had affected my eyes and stuff. And he thought my blood sugars and all this kind of stuff dropped, but I was all right. So I took some time out and then started running then. And the run was one mile laps for 262 laps. I, I almost fucking knew any blades of grass they were on the floor. <laughs> and the rain, sometimes the rain was bad. And then one day I thought, you know, I was, I mean, we're all in the same boat. I like being on my own. And there was one night I just thought, I'm going to fucking wake up at two in the morning. I woke up at two in the morning, whacked my headphones on, just stuck my dad on, and went, right, you're fucking having it today. And I didn't listen to anyone, and I just listened to my dad live. And I went, like, this is like pff, halfway into the run, so I'd done 150 so miles, and I just bollocked it. Did half, half a marathon without even thinking about it, because the motorhead took that the pain and everything away from me. I was switched off. It was just, I was in the zone. I'll never forget it. I took the music off. Fuck me, I wanted to faint. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what have I done? Uh, but uh, it was good while it lasted. So, yeah. That's in, that's immense. So let me ask you, so there's there's people here listening now and they're watching this and they're probably thinking, well, I was thinking of getting into an Ironman or something like that until I heard what you go through. Like, what are some of the tips that you have for people who want to get into endurance sports such as Ironman triathlon or some sort of extreme adventure like this? You know, is it listen to music? Is it do it for uh, with a charity because then you've got that accountability? Learn to daydream. Like, what what are your tips that you have for people that they can apply? Uh, yeah, don't let me put you off by saying what I've gone through. It, it's, I mean, it was. It's all even though it hurts, it's all enjoyable. Trust me. Uh, so when you cross that line and you've gone through all that, it's fucking great. But one of the things I would do, do it for charity as well because it does give you a good reason to go and. You know, push yourself for that your chosen charity. Uh, another thing is, take your time. If, if you're new to it, don't you know? Don't rush it. Get a coach. A coach helps a lot because a lot of people tend to overtrain. Uh, and once I got a coach called Will Fit, he helped a, a, a lot, uh, and he see me through a lot of my challenges. Um, and just, just fucking enjoy it, man. It's there to be enjoyed, and 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 it's, nutrition is very important as well. Uh, you know, you get people fainting and people running out of food and stuff. Make sure you have all the food and all the relevant food and drink you need in your back pockets and stuff. Uh, and just don't spend loads of money on bikes. Just buy something basic. See if you like it, and if you do like it, then start looking at. Uh, putting some money into it but uh, i mean you don't need all that fancy stuff yeah you yeah don't. all of that you, honestly you don't everyone thinks we've got of all, all, all this kid no you don't if you can swim if you can cycle and you can run sign up and the best thing to do is just go sign up you've done it you've got yourself a goal and you've got your mind you've got something to set your mind up and work towards yeah yeah for sure like I, i've done all my i well all my i man all three of them on a bike that I got for second hand for like 800 bucks. You know, it's good enough because anything more than that is, is just going to be wasted on me. I could go and lose five pounds instead of, you know, spend another couple of grand on a lighter bike. And one of the things that really helped me that I found was just completely absorbing myself in the community, like following you on Strava, following other people on Strava, and then, you know, being connected with people online, just buying all the magazines. I just found just completely 
submerging myself in that culture really helps because then all of a sudden you are creating with these bonds through suffering and you don't feel like you're the only person out there like oh whoa me going through this pain it's like man these people are going through more pain i deserve to chase chase a little more or i can do it and it just gives you the support without actually having that community directly around you yeah i mean Join to like we've got the Sleep Me Dead Tri Club. I mean, if you join the triathlon club, you're there with everyone who's who's into the same th stuff as you. They're all talking, you, you know, you're all talking about. I signed up for this one. You signed up for that one. Oh, let's go together. Do you know what I mean? And you all suffer together, and you all share experiences together, and you all train together as well. And the good thing about our club is, you know, we've got uh, Simon, he's you know, qualified swim coach and all that kind of stuff. So. We go out on rides, on bike rides with the team as well. So it's it's just, yeah, it's nice to join a club and, and be part of something and rather than just doing it all on your own. Some people like to do it on their own, but, you know, if you want to be part of something, join a club. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, like, if people were to say, for instance, okay, but what's Pritchard's training program? Are you, like, reluctant to give something like that out because that's specifically designed for you and it's not, like, a cookie-cutter program? Or is this something that you can suggest to people or, again, you suggest that they get a coach or, or apply and find out what works for them? I mean, when I was with Whittle, it would be he, he knew what I was capable of, so everything was written to my to what he knew I could do. Uh, at the end, you can do it all by yourself. You know, you don't need anyone to tell you. Just swim, bike, run, and just see how you get along. Uh, I'm not with Will at the moment because I'm just so busy. I just don't want to waste his time in putting, doing stuff, and then we end up not doing it because I'm here, there, left, right, and centre. So I just choose my moments. At the moment, I'm out, out, out for the count. So, but um, f for anyone else, I mean, just yeah, just. Yeah. If you can't afford a coach, just go easy. Just don't go too mental. Work, work your way up. Do it. You, you, you know yourself through bodybuilding. You know you're not going to walk in and start deadlifting at 200 k's. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, you start start low. And work, work your way up. Do a bit of speed work. Do a bit of hill work. Do a bit of you know mix it all up. Yeah, because I, I tell you what, what I what I found extremely surprising was that there's definitely more in injuries occurring in endurance sports such as uh, running or Ironman triathlon uh, as more than there is in strength training which is crazy to me but then you can see because of the constant repetitiveness just driving yourself especially from the run that people just undergo so many foot ankle knee issues that it's just crazy so it is very very important that you don't and that's a, that's a problem. A lot of endurance athletes overtrain. You know, they, they don't nourish themselves as, as well as they possibly could. But that overtraining is uh, definitely a, a huge component of it. And that's, that's why I started doing strength training with Josh Davis in Cardiff. Because, you know, I'd go three, th three times a week with him just to do strength training. Because, the, like you said, the endurance, if your body's not strong enough to cope with the endurance and the constant bang, 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 run, swim, bike, run, you know, you, you're going you're gonna to injure yourself. So I think doing a strength training, doing strength training with Josh made my legs and my body stronger to be able to handle the distances I was doing. Yeah, for sure. Because otherwise, if you don't have the muscle, muscular strength, you're going to have more stress placed on like your connective tissue, like your tendons, ankles, and your skeletal system. So now transitioning from, okay, endurance athlete to the dirty vegan tv show the dirty vegan books and you weren't you weren't vegan all your life i think it was like in 2015 you transitioned into more veganism and plant-based uh like where did that come from why was that was it because of uh, ethical issues was it because of the taste you know what where did that come from i was um i love animals <laughs> i've always loved animals like most people uh and I, I, I started research because there was a lot of endurance athletes which were um, vegan. Oh, yeah, there so is started, a lot. But yeah, started, a lot of them. And I started researching and thinking, why are these guys, why, why guys and women vegan? And, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and I just got a dog as well, Lemmy. And then the more I kept researching it, the more I just, I just kept opening my eyes and I'm thinking, you know, this makes, this makes sense. You know, I wouldn't eat Lemmy. 
because you know and so what's the difference between lemmy a pig or a chicken or a cow or a lamb it's, you know they're, they're fucking animals but we've been bred from a young age to say yep this one's all right for you to eat that one isn't and then somebody told me to watch cowspiracy uh watch cowspiracy you know <laughs> and i know that was that was the light moment i just looked at it and swear whoa i just thought veganism was all about um not eating meat eggs dairy uh honey or anything derived from animals but the impact on the environment with the with the um, uh, fat in, in industrial farming uh, factory farming and all that kind of stuff and it just i just went i just thought right that's it i'm going vegan uh, and i literally went vegan the next day and luckily because of my catering background i sort of understood food more than most so yeah i found it a little bit harder a little bit easier to uh, do the change and i lost a bit of weight at first but uh, as soon as my body i think that was just the shit coming off my body but as soon as i started getting into it it was it was all good and that's when i sort of and my times, my swimming times, and my bike times, and my running times were getting better as well. And uh, and I thought, well, it can't, it's not, can't be a coincidence. It must be down to the, you know, it must be down to the vegan diet. And I thought, well, let's do, let's do a YouTube show as well. But at the time, my confidence was not the best in front of a camera because obviously I hadn't been in front of a camera for years. Uh, but it's something I really wanted to do, and I was just like, oh. And so I, you know, I just asked a friend, some friends, and they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. So I thought, fuck it. If we just we just got this place, put me in front of the camera, and I just started cooking. And we, we yeah, we had we had a right laugh. It was really, really good. Really enjoyed filming it. Um, and we launched it, uh, not last year, the year before. Uh, and it took off. And then the BBC phoned because they saw it and they said oh we're interested in doing a tv show with you for a vegan tv show which uh and they told me the format i thought oh, this is brilliant so we started filming and when we started filming because at the time they were going to do a show called wild man to wire man where i was going to be the first person to do the triath circumference triathlon of wales and then at the same time we were filming the show and then they told me that we, we've got a book to go with the show. And I'm like, whoa, I've got to fucking sleep. <laughs> I sleep when you're dead, but you know the score. You've got to fucking have at least some sleep. Yeah. It was just like, I didn't train. I, I'd be honest, I did, didn't have any time to train for that round the Wales thing. I just didn't. And then and they said, oh, well, what, what kind of food are you going to use for this book? And I said, well, I'm going to have to use my YouTube recipes because... You know, that's I haven't got time to film it. All right, cool. These are YouTube recipes, but we're going to need measurements. Why well, cook with my eye? Obviously, nobody else does. So then I had to try. So when I'd finished filming, I'd get back late and I'd be laying, just sitting there, like sort of working out ingredients and measurements and all that kind of stuff, and then just writing it and re emailing it off. But um, yeah, it was an, it was a, an exciting time. And uh, so the book was released then December the 27th, and then the show came out then last January. So yeah, and uh, the, I think that the, yeah, the first book was a bestseller on Amazon, and and, and the show did really well on BBC. So yeah, was, yeah, like that, like that, that blew up really quick because a lot of people, like I have my family, message me, hey, look, Pritchard's on TV again, and uh, like I know that blew up really, really quick, and like the book has had a couple of hundred, more than a couple of hundred, uh, four and a half star reviews on Amazon. That's the first book, you know. Where's Going the other fucking star? Well, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's the meat eaters out there. Who knows? But anyway, it's it's going really, really well. So has has the, what was has the purpose behind the book been fulfilled? Like transitioning more people behind plant based diets. Like I'm sure you're getting a lot of people contacting you now. I I started following these recipes because like you know my fiance has been making recipes from the book. She did one again last night, and obviously it makes things 
it creates so much more variety because it, it's funny. You look at some of the ingredients, you think, wow, it's too many. It really isn't. It's not that hard at all. It's very easy to apply. But how many people have you got now contacting you or with responses to say that they've actually tried plant-based or veganism for the very first time? Now this is something that they do continuous. It's quite funny you say about the recipes because the whole point of doing the book for me is because I think a lot of people that follow me, they're not cooks. And I wanted to try and make the book as easy to follow as possible. Now, there's nothing worse than opening a cookbook, seeing a million ingredients and a fucking method like that. Yeah. That puts me right off. I'm not interested. If you've just, like, just, it's just honest, you know. When I say I'm a chef, I don't call myself a chef, I call myself a cook. I mean, chefs. They're fancy chefs are. They do all the fancy stuff. I really enjoy cooking, uh, homemade cooking, comfort food, all that kind of stuff. And just to make cooking easier and more accessible for people who can't cook and who want to who want to cook plant based meals. So that was that was that's one thing I wanted to make those books easy to follow. Uh, and since the book did come out in the Wild Man to Wire Man, a lot of people have, have, have messaged me on Instagram and. On Facebook and stuff, and just yeah, just saying, fucking hell, man, thanks very much. You know, I used to be a massive meat eater, and now I don't eat any meat at all. I feel really good, and there's a lot of people who have taken up, you know, have said they were addicted to drugs and alcohol and stuff, and they said now, you know, I'm I've just started doing um, triathlons. I feel so much better, blah blah blah. So having messages off people like that is really. Yes, it's well, it's good, isn't it? It's yeah, nice. it gives you it's the nice purpose. To, it's, yeah, it gives gives a purpose. It's nice to see that you know I'm I'm doing something which is changing changing people's lives. So yeah, I'll con, yeah continue to do it. I mean, don't get me wrong. <laughs> There's a lot of fucking dickheads out there. I'm sure you, <laughs> I'm sure you know. It's that time of month, Chris. I'm just. I mean, I advertised. I advertised the Day Vegan book, uh, the second one, on Facebook. Didn't put any preaching. I don't really do that kind of preaching stuff. I just put a uh, book for veganery, easy to follow recipes. Fucking hell, I hate that guy. Really? Of What's meat, what sort of... Of, of, of meat, of meat eaters. Oh, really? Now, meat, eaters, meat eaters. I'm not going to go meat eaters now, whatever, because not, you're, you're not all like that. But they always say, how do you know a person is vegan? Because they tell you. And they always say, "Could you pre? Could we preach?" <laughs> you have a look at my advert on Facebook. Some of the, some of the comments is just wow, unbelievable. And, and the Welsh farm comments from the Welsh farming community, they've uh, let themselves down a little bit. To be oh, honest. really? Okay, got it. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, I guess so because, like you said, well, like we know, I should say, is that uh, you know, in Wales, we got more sheep than we do have humans. You know, so you're probably going to get a little bit of that backlash there. But I think, you know, the overall, the overall uh, consensus should be that you just have to have an open mind. Look, if somebody wants to go vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian, whatever it may be, let them do their thing. You know, you can just put your story out there. You can say, look, you feel so much better because of it. Your time's improved because of it. And other people are feeling the same. Then why not? You know, you just have to have open. People have different religious beliefs. And that's fine. As long as it's not hurting anybody else, continue down that path. Yeah. And, and, and that's my point exactly. I mean, I, I try not. I, well, I don't try. I don't do. I don't never, never told anyone, don't eat meat. I don't agree with it. But I can't tell you're adult enough to make your own decisions. I can't, you know, the more I tell you not to, the more you're going to do it in front of my face. And the other thing that, that a lot of media does say is, are you vegans a week? You're going to, I mean, week, really? I mean, well, I've just done 10 I am as in 10 fucking days, you fucking know, man. I mean, I, <laughs> if let's, anything, it's, done, it's, do it's, it. done, it's, it's done the fucking opposite. I have I felt better. I mean, yeah, it's just, and, and like 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 you said, I told people, look, you eat meat. I mean, I agree with it. I eat vegetables. Let's just stop fucking arguing. Get on with it. That's Don't cool. call me a pussy. Stop going mm, bacon and stop being the fucking big man because it's not funny. It's yeah. a fucking chitter joke on planet Earth. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm, I for one, and people know who follow me. Like I go vegan or vegetarian for a couple. Like I, I went two months last year. 
And uh, I did it again this year. I was plant-based uh, while I was uh, just before going to Costa Rica and the whole time that I was in Costa Rica. And I like to just play in both worlds. Sometimes I go pescatarian, you know, I just follow that. I like to transition into different things. I don't have any sort of like beliefs that I'm trying to push upon people because like, you know, I've got a lot of clients from India and 62% of the population there That's are veg vegan. vegetarian and vegan, yeah. So, you know, it's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. You just kind of find what works for you. The one thing that we can all agree upon is that we all definitely eat to, need to eat more plants. There's no doubt about it. Like, I think I probably eat more plants than most vegans anyway. <laughs> but that, I think that is something that needs to be encouraged a lot more. You can't, you can't argue with science. You can't fact. You can't. But the meat eaters will. They'll just keep on just like... <sighs> You know, it's just, yeah, I mean, I I just find it hard to, because um, I choose a plant-based diet. I'm not hurting anybody. I choose not to kill animals or have animals slaughtered for myself. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a lot of the meat eaters. If you told them to go to the field and kill a cow and go and cut yourself off a steak, they'd fucking cry. It's like, you know, you walk into a supermarket, it's nice prepared for you. You haven't to have to do the dirty work. That's simple, isn't it? You know, walk in, where well, yeah, got steak. <laughs> well, go in the abattoir, son. Go and cut yourself off and fill it. Well, I'm not doing that. Exactly. So, hey. Yeah. So it is what it is, isn't it? Let me ask you, because you're on like a vegan diet, and like, do you, su yeah. do you supplement at all to help support anything that you may be missing, whether it could be your vitamin B levels or your iron levels or anything like that? And because you do a lot of endurance as well, do you have any fear that your testosterone levels may drop? Uh, so far, I'm doing pretty well. And as far as B12 goes, I do supplement B12. And they say B even meat eaters should supplement B12. B12 is a bacteria which is found in the earth. Uh, and recent farming methods and pesticides and all that. Thing, so it's sort of killed the B12 that should be in the ground. I mean, cows and stuff and animals will eat the B12. Will eat and it goes into them. Even animals get injected with a B12 injection, fortified with B12. So even if you're a meat eater or a plant eater, you should still supplement supplement a B12. As for iron, there's plenty of iron in, veg in, in certain vegetables. But I do, when I, when I, at the moment I don't, but when I'm at the height of training, I will supplement with an iron, with, with some iron, and that's it really. Yeah. Uh, in, in the winter, I do, I do, uh, I do a vitamin, vitamin D. It's the happy pill, isn't it? Because yeah. we don't get, because we don't get much sun over here, so I get some vitamin D instead. Yeah. So that's 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 all. That's yeah. That's 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 all I do. And uh, what about your like? Are you, have you have any fears with your testosterone levels because of doing that? You know, because like I know when you're doing anything past like an hour of continuous endurance, you know, it can raise your cortisol levels up quite high and then subsequently your testosterone levels can come down especially you know you're spending so much time in that position on the bike have has that ever been a concern for you but you know i've never i've never looked into it okay now that you just mentioned it i've never looked into it but it, i can imagine like if, if you if you say i can imagine 1200 miles on a bike yeah. is uh you know 21 hours a day for three hours sleep but it's not going to do much for your testosterone i suppose is it yeah well obviously yeah if you're not sleeping that's going to be a bad one obviously for testosterone like if you look at the statistics of people today compared to say 20 30 years ago testosterone levels has declined huge and obviously there's environmental factors. We have EMF, we're exposed to artificial light a lot of the time, spending more times indoors. We're up later at night, getting less sleep. There's a lot of different factors, but I know that they've measured endurance athletes in particular because of the amount of time that is needed for activity, especially things of like what you're doing, that cortisol level can become more systemic and testosterone level can uh, uh, reduce. You know, how would you how would you keep your testosterone level high though to stop fucking having a wank? No, 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 it's not that, mate. But, uh, you'd, you'd be sorted. You'd be sorted. <laughs> Apparently, they say if you keep that in, it keeps that that keeps that, that anger. You. Yeah, maybe the yeah. anger. Yeah, there's some alphas out there, but it doesn't mean that they have high testosterone no, levels. No, no. Well, you're doing the right thing with strength training because that can assist for sure. And obviously, sleep is a is a big thing. 
Um, you know, there are certain supplements that you can take, you know, like ashwagandha, KSM 66. I got ashwagandha. Well, there you go then. There you go. Uh, but downstairs, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll, cool. se I'll send you some Ferrodrox, so there you go. That will that will help you with your testosterone levels. It's, you know, it's a natural supplementation that you can take. There's various things that you can take that can help support or maintain healthy testosterone levels, you know. And what does that testosterone do? It just gives you more... Uh... Well, no, the testosterone, obviously, if it, when your testosterone level's lower, you'll age quicker, you know? So, you know, if you, you don't want your estrogen and testosterone levels to get out of ratio because, you know, you're going to age quicker, my man. We don't want that from you, Pritch. You've done no, enough. No. You've done I mean, enough to I'm, I'm increase your age. I'm not looking too bad. I'm at 47 in March. I'm not looking too bad. Not bad. You know, not too shabby, man. No. Hashtag no filter. Yeah, hashtag no filter, yeah. yeah. All right, but at the moment, at the moment, Chris, I'm fucking, I'm absolutely screwed. When I tried, went to Dubai and, and um, went to Dubai on a skate trip, my fucking second day fell fucking off and just yeah, know, yeah, yeah I, I know about that. What? Tracking, how tracking. did how did that happen in uh, in in Dubai? What was that? A skate team that flew you over there recently, or what? No, I, yeah, we just when me date went over to the skate teams for people over forties, blah blah, all the old fuckers still loving skateboarding. It was amazing. The, the best skate parks, the best weather. Just, you know, skate all day, a few beers to the boys in the night. Brilliant. Repeat. Second day, fucking went flying on my back. And I just couldn't. I had to sit down and watch everyone having fun for the rest of the week, which pissed me right off. I like, I like you, I like being stuck in. And then I got home and I went to the infirmary. And they were like, oh, no, you're all right, you're cool. And I just thought, you were fucking lying, fuckers. <laughs> fucking agony. And then I got a few phone calls and said, oh, can you come back in, Mr. Pritchard? And then they had they found a fracture in my back. So ever since, I haven't, well, I haven't done anything. Apart from, I hit the bottle a little bit, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest. I hit the bottle, uh, ate lots of food, put on shitloads of weight. And um, I go and see the specialist on the 15th of January, so fingers crossed. Uh, I haven't got much time out because uh, I got a few plans for next year, and I want to get fit. Yeah, and what would be the recovery for a fractured fractured spine? I'm, I'll find out now on the fifteenth. Yeah, Man, I'll I, ask him. I tell you what, it made for an amazing picture, though. If you. <laughs> If, Fuck. if you guys uh, check out Pritchard's Instagram, you'll see the picture of him actually coming out of a, a coming out of the bowl there in the half pipe. Uh, that picture was pretty phenomenal just before you wiped out. Yeah, it was like in this moment I knew I fucked up, but um, there you go. there we are. I'm Is still it, breathing. Do you think it's because you'd spent so much time off the board, or you'd or had you been practicing quite a lot before you went there? I'd spent a lot of time off the board. Uh, and but it was, I just I could feel that you know when you felt like I, I'm slowly starting to get it back again, I just felt like that. And if anything, because I did, it, it was all down to confidence. And if I went into it with full confidence, it wouldn't have happened. Because you know, because of my age and my, you know, it's just sort of my mind's playing tricks on me. I just went. Well, I just gave it half the effort and. I paid the price. We yeah. Fucked it. Came out half arsed. But yeah. anyway, okay, so uh, we'll wrap this up now, Pritch. But you have your second book now, Dirty Vegan Another Bite, uh, that is available. Here we go. Here's one we prepared earlier. <laughs> Ooh, look at that. So fantastic images. Like you can see, you know, description is great. Very short, short and simple ingredients there for you to add. And it's available on Amazon. Uh, the price goes up and down in the varies every day. So, but yeah, it's on Amazon. Just type in Dirty Vegan and away you go. And we'll put the link to both of your books in the show notes here as well. And we'll put some uh, links to some of those escapades uh, so you can yeah. see what uh, Pritchard's been up to. But, mate, thank you very much for this podcast interview. It's been a long time coming, brother. Cheers, Chris. Nice to make. Take it easy. And I'll speak to you soon. Will do. All right, everybody. Thank you very much Keep for joining. Keep pumping, baby. Keep pumping. Boom. There it is. Thank you, everybody. We will speak Cheers, to you man. next week.